three-time unsuccessful candidate for the U.S. presidency in the 1800s, Garrett Smith said, I am a plain man and I care and know comparatively little about rhetoric. Some of you might share the same sentiments about rhetoric. Interestingly, while rhetoric dates back to ancient Greece, in fact, everything we know about rhetoric comes from the Greeks, many of us have no idea what classical rhetoric really is. And that's what we will focus on today, a very brief overview of classical rhetoric. Volumes have been written on the subject, but we will concentrate on sophists and sophistry, Aristotle's definition of rhetoric, and modes of rhetorical proof, briefly covering both artistic and inartistic modes of proof. To understand sophistry and rhetoric, we'll start with a brief history lesson. In 5th century BC, you could have made a living as a sophist. A sophist was a type of teacher in both ancient Greece and in the Roman Empire who specialized in philosophy and rhetoric, traveling around the country making public displays to attract students. Sophists claimed that they were teaching excellence or virtue to the nobility and politicians and those desiring to be politicians. Sophists, however, were condemned by Aristotle, Plato, and others for two primary reasons. The first, horror of horrors, was that sophists actually charged for their teachings. This meant that only the rich could afford to be educated in the important topics of philosophy and rhetoric, a completely opposite view from Socrates, for example. This was a bigger issue than it appears today. In ancient Greece, there were no attorneys, so you had to represent yourself in court. Consider, if only the rich had the skills of persuasion, then if you were poor, you were doomed to lose. The rich would get richer and have more power, while the poor would get poorer and become even more powerless. Secondly, sophists were accused of often using the tools of rhetoric and poetry to manipulate others by trading on emotions and neglecting facts. In fact, some sophists claimed that they could find the answer to any questions. They could basically win every argument. Another way of saying this is that sophists taught and were known for their ability to make the weaker or worse argument the stronger or better argument. Philosophers like Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle were appalled by this, as they believed quite the contrary. The skilled use of rhetoric was essential to the discovery of truths, because it provided the means of ordering and clarifying arguments. They denounced sophists as greedy instructors using language and rhetoric to deceive. Rather than being concerned with truth and justice, sophists were intent on seeking power. In fact, Plato was quoted as saying, Rhetoric is the art of ruling the minds of men not a very positive view. And that's why the term sophistry today has a negative connotation. If you look up sophistry at dictionary.com, you will find two definitions, both equally damning. First, a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible, but generally fallacious method of reasoning. And second, a false argument, sophism. While in ancient Greece, sophists were very popular, well-paid, and widely respected for their skills and talents, they were also widely criticized, and that connotation has remained with us over the years. You can hear this in the warning of U.S. President John Adams. Abuse of words has been the greatest instrument of sophistry and chicanery of party, faction, and division of society. So you probably don't want to be accused of being a sophist or of using an argument that is described as mere sophistry. Regardless, rhetoric evolved as an important art, one that provided the orator, or the speaker, with ways to persuade an audience to accept an orator's argument. Remember how frequently the word rhetoric was used in the discussion of the sophists? Rhetoric itself is not a bad word. Rhetoric is a tool, and just as with any tool, it can be used for good or bad purposes. Many consider the father of rhetoric to be Aristotle, who was a student of Plato and a teacher of Alexander the Great. Even the etymology of his name is instructive. Aristotle means the best purpose. Aristotle has been called one of the greatest philosophers of all time. He literally wrote the book on rhetoric. Actually, his book titled The Rhetoric is in fact three volumes, published in 4th century BC. Aristotle views rhetoric as a human art or skill. He defines rhetoric as the faculty of observing, in any given case, the available means of persuasion. A simple way to think of this is to ask yourself how you can prove something to be true. What skills and techniques can you use to persuade someone? You use written, spoken, and visual language. You use rhetoric. According to Aristotle, every speech must contain both artistic and inartistic proofs. Inartistic proofs are things that exist. They are there. In the words of Aristotle, of all the modes of persuasion, some belong strictly to the art of rhetoric and some do not. By the latter, and he's talking about inartistic proofs, 
I mean such things that are not supplied by the speaker, but are there at the outset. Witnesses, evidence given under torture, written contracts, etc. By the former, and here he's talking about artistic proofs, I mean such as we ourselves construct by means of the principles of rhetoric. The one kind has merely to be used, the other has to be invented. Most scholars focus on three artistic proofs, ethos, pathos, and logos. But Aristotle also considered the five canons of rhetoric, as developed by first-century Roman philosopher Marcus Cicero, as contributing to artistic proofs. Inventio, or invention, the creative process of developing and refining your arguments. Dispositio, or arrangement, organization, the process of arranging and organizing your arguments for maximum impact. Elocutio, or style, the process of determining how you present your arguments using figures of speech and other rhetorical techniques. This is very much related to language. Memoria, or memory, which is the process of learning and memorizing your speech so that you can deliver it without using notes. Additionally, this canon referred to memorizing information that can be used in an impromptu speech, such as famous quotations, literary references, and other facts. And actio, or the process of practicing how you deliver your speech using gestures, posture, facial expression, as well as pronunciation and tone of voice. But let's get back to the artistic proofs of ethos, pathos, and logos. Briefly, ethos is considered the personal appeals of the speaker. The simplest translation is credibility, although, as we will discuss in a moment, ethos is much more than that. Pathos relates to tapping into or stirring the emotions of the audience, the emotional appeals. And logos is the use of evidence and reasoning to communicate the message. It refers to the structure of argument, focusing on the message. Now remember the inartistic proofs, such as facts, statistics, and testimony? They can be used to create artistic proofs. It is how we use them which creates the specific proof, and the proofs are often blended together. They are interwoven. In the 4th century BC, Aristotle identified five inartistic proofs, laws, contracts, witnesses, tortures, and oaths. Some believe that if Aristotle were alive today, he would likely have replaced tortures with photographs and added statistical surveys, experiments, and government documents. Statistics, for example, are facts, inartistic proofs. One out of every two marriages in the United States ends in divorce. It is sterile information. Now use this statistic, this inartistic proof, in a speech. You can use this statistic to build credibility or ethos by saying, the U.S. Census has been reporting for some time that 50% of all marriages will end in divorce. Showing that you've done research and can cite credible sources contributes to your audience's perception of you as credible. It can also be used to gain pathos by appealing to emotions. Turn and look at the person sitting next to you. One of the two of you will likely get a divorce. And it can be used for logos by using reasoning. Because one out of every two marriages here in the United States ends in divorce, it is imperative we reform the court system to be fair to both men and women. And the same statistic can be blended together to contribute to all three, building ethos, pathos, and logos. The U.S. Census reports that half of all marriages end in divorce. That means that one out of every two marriages are not successful. It could be yours. It could be the person sitting next to you. And if you are a woman, your chances of a fair settlement are far lower than if you are a man. Therefore, we must reform our court system. Aristotle said that every speech must have all three artistic proofs, and they must be in balance with each other. And that's why you may also see these three proofs displayed as the rhetorical triangle. If a speech is more heavily weighted with pathos than logos, you will end up with a speech that is emotionally arousing, but nothing substantial for the audience to remember. A speech focused on logos, however, that does not get the audience involved, is very boring. Some scholars believe that Aristotle felt the most important of all three of these modes of proof was ethos. If we don't trust the speaker, we won't accept the premise of the speech. Indeed, we may not even listen to it. Poor ethos and the other two modes, logos and pathos, are useless. According to Aristotle, ethos is more than just credibility. He defined ethos as a demonstration of the speaker's intelligence, integrity, and goodwill. Ethos is an attribute conferred by the audience on the speaker. As such, these are all perceived intelligence, perceived integrity, and perceived goodwill. One speaker may be perceived as having good ethos by one person, no ethos by another, and poor ethos by a third. With ethos, you're asking yourself, how can I get this audience to believe in me? Intelligence refers to authoritativeness, 
Does the speaker appear intelligent, informed, knowledgeable, and credible? Oftentimes, this is described as shared values between the speaker and the audience. Audiences determine intelligence by the overlap between their own beliefs and the speaker's ideas. Many scholars have defined this shared values as intelligence as, my idea of an agreeable speaker is one who agrees with me. Another word for integrity is character or trustworthiness. This refers to a speaker's image as a good and honest person. It is related to fairness and consistency. Author C.S. Lewis was quoted as saying, integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. The third dimension of ethos, goodwill, addresses whether the audience believes that a speaker, or the source of a message, has the audience's best interest at heart. It has been described as a positive judgment of the speaker's intention toward the audience. Aristotle thought it was possible for a speaker to demonstrate extraordinary intelligence and sterling character, yet not have the listener's best interest at heart. All three of these dimensions, then, contribute to the audience's assessment of a speaker's ethos. Aristotle also discussed how ethos is communicated in a speech. Remember, in the time of the Greeks, rhetoric referred primarily to public speaking. There was no television, radio, etc., and oral communication was the way messages were primarily communicated. Today, however, we have many different ways to communicate with others, and the concept of ethos applies to these methods as well. Ethos can be communicated to an audience intrinsically or extrinsically. Intrinsic ethos is contained in the speech text. Think about it as the words you are using to build your credibility. Say you were able to transcribe what you are telling a potential employer in an interview about your experience. If you can point to the manuscript and say, there, that's where I told her I was qualified, you are pointing to intrinsic ethos. Extrinsic ethos results from the qualities of the speaker, him or herself. This refers to the speaker's appearance, occupation, gender, dynamic presentation style, including vocal quality, humor, and posture. It is what the speaker brings to the communication event, not what the speaker says. In general, being well organized, using personal examples, wearing clothing appropriate for the occasion and the audience, and the like, will help create a sense of ethos. Additionally, when you cite sources and use the quotations of others, you can gain secondary credibility. Your ethos is enhanced because of the ethos of those you include in your presentation. Pathos refers to the emotional appeals. When you are using pathos, you are appealing to the audience's emotions in your effort to persuade. You ask yourself, how can I get the audience emotionally involved? By using imagery, description, personal and audience-related examples, asking rhetorical questions, having the audience create a scene in their minds, all of them are techniques to create pathos. All you have to do is watch a commercial or two during the Olympics televised broadcast to see pathos in action. Appeal to patriotism is very strong, but you'll also see appeals to the American work ethic, nostalgia, which is an appeal to tradition, and of course, plenty of sex appeal. And I'm sure you'll find other appeals as well, such as snob appeal, fear, bandwagon, the list just goes on. When you are using logos, you are creating a sense of reasoning in the audience. Logos allows your audience to make the logical connections in the speech. With logos, you are asking yourself, how can I get this audience to see the reasonableness of this speech, that the speech makes sense? Using reasoning patterns that are logical to the audience allows them to understand how you reached your conclusions. This also allows the audience to reach the same conclusions along with you. Two types of logical proof are exposition and argumentation. When you are using the logical proof of exposition, you are proving your point by definitions and examples. You are using evidence. This type of proof is used to clarify, explain, or analyze a topic. In contrast, argumentation is an argument in its formal sense, reasoning. When you study argumentation, you will learn about inductive and deductive arguments, syllogisms, and enthymemes. And of course, to be logical, you must make sure you use appropriate and valid evidence, as well as avoiding committing fallacies or mistakes in reasoning. Processing time. Why does sophistry have such a negative connotation? What is the difference between Aristotle's artistic and inartistic proofs? Which of Aristotle's three modes of proof do you think is the most important? And how can you increase the likelihood that your audience will perceive you as having good ethos? The ancient Greeks have taught us much about persuasion that is still important to know about today. Now that you have a better understanding of classical rhetoric, perhaps you can use it ethically to persuade.
rather than unethically to manipulate.